And who was doing it? Oh, Alex, you're also recording, right? Yep. All right, so I'm gonna share my screen. Um, all right, someone tell me if you can see the slides. Yep. Yeah, good, okay. <laughs> So if you have questions as we go along, please feel free to use the chat function. Uh, we have people who are gonna be answering those as we go, if it's appropriate to type an answer. And if it's not, we will bring up uh, questions at the end. There should be plenty of time for q and I hope this is not you know, all me talking because it's awkward to talk to silence as we all know now. Um, so uh, this is the Universal Teaching and Learning Work Group and we have drafted some recommendations that we'll be submitting um, this hopefully in the next couple weeks, basically. Um, so the purpose of the group um, is to find out what the best practices are, essentially to encourage our students to, to be successful. And so um, we came up with uh, eight recommendations that we think will support our instructors and our students in um, basically ensuring that students stay on the path. So this is part of the guided pathways um, efforts. Um, so the things we were tasked with is um, to find how we can incorporate universal learning design, um, which is a, an accessibility thing. So in other words, to make sure that all of the um, educational materials we produce are accessible for anybody. And um, so that was a big focus with our suggestions. Um, we want to increase student engagement across the campus and um, evaluate what's important in our syllabi and also in communicating how people are supposed to write their syllabus. Um, we wanted to look at professional development, so one of our recommendations involves that. And um, also evaluate what kind of learning strategies are most effective in keeping students engaged and successful and also how do we incentivize using those resources how do we teach people to use them uh, those kind of ideas okay and so all of those uh, things get passed on to the guided pathways council after we're done this is our team membership um, pretty diverse group from all across campus but largely, you know, pretty heavy on the faculty because that's, oh, apparently, Alex, you're a facult. Sorry, <laughs> should be a why on that. Uh, anyway, I probably did that. Anyway, so this is the people you can talk to if you have suggestions or ideas. Um, and our timeline is pretty much we, this is our last forum, and we will be using any feedback we get today and the feedback we got from faculty caucus earlier in the month to to draft our to turn our final report into guided pathways committee or sorry council um, it's not going to be by Friday I think but at least pretty soon so here's the basic overview of our recommendations we think that a teaching and learning center is an instrumental way of ensuring um, that all of our charges get get addressed essentially. And so a lot of our other ideas are centered on having a teaching and learning center, a center where you can go to, um, to solve all sorts of problems that happen, happen when you're teaching. And um, we'll go into more depth in, in each one of these in a second. But we also wanted to revise professional development uh, and sort of clarify it a little bit and um, have a formal structure for supplemental instruction built into our classes, or at least the ability to do that. We also wanna look at our hiring practices because who you hire and how you hire them um, and the diversity in your hiring pool is an important element in student success. So we wanna, we wanna tie that piece into it. We also need uh, to look at what kind of instructional technologies are going to be useful for us going forward in a more student-centered environment. Um, we need one location with standard syllabus requirements instead of, you know, eight or seven, eight or nine different emails every semester. Um, we also wanna look at classroom spaces uh, because if you want to teach in a student-centered way, the room and, and the sort of infrastructure matters a great deal. And then our last thing is uh, to sort of encourage uh, developing a campus-wide teaching principles just to kind of establish what our teaching culture looks like. 
um, both for us and for the students. Okay, so about the teaching and learning center. Uh, basically, we envision this as having sort of two pieces. One that's a physical place to go, um, where if whether you're having technology issues or you have a sort of like, how can I teach this SLO the best question, uh, whatever your question is, it's one place to go and find the help that you need. Um, right now, it's kind of diffuse when you have a technology problem. It's not clear. Do I go to ed tech? Do I go to IT? Do I ask my colleague sitting next to me? That kind of thing. And we would like it to be a little bit more centralized so that you don't have to guess where to go. Um, we want the Teaching and Learning Center to um, provide some trainings both to students and instructors. And so like for this semester, it would have been fantastic to have uh, a little video recorded that's stored in the TLC where I can tell students, okay, if you don't know how to attach a file to an email, go watch this video. And it'll walk you through exactly the, the, the same Word software we use and the same email platform and all of that will be the same for, for um, that way the students can see what they really do rather than um, using someone's random YouTube video to do the same thing. Um, so that sort of training for students, but also instructors, you know, uh, how do I post my grades to Blackboard? <laughs> that would have been a great video to have access to. And so that's the kind of stuff we envision the TLC might provide. Uh, we would like it to also have a variety of options. Right now the virtual would have been really great but um, there was a lot of request at our institute in January to have informal brown bag lunches, kind of like an opportunity to come and learn about a new pedagogy or a new um, you know, technology or something like that in a relatively informal environment. And also just to allow you to talk to your colleagues more often. Um, but then there would also be formal trainings and ideally, our recommendation is to have them recorded and placed on the internet so that if I can't make it because I'm in lab, Maybe I can go to the recording and look at it later. Um, the whole point of the of the TLC is going to be just to foster a culture where we're all looking for ways to improve um, our teaching and learning systems together. Um, the the one way to integrate that center with the professional development system that we have is if there is a digital badging system. So say that I attend a, a seminar on, I don't know, active learning or something like that. The TLC could, could institute a system where they have a badging available. So it's a you know, little picture that you can put in your Blackboard site or on your yearly review or whatever you want to do with it that just says it's sort of like a certificate of accomplishment really but it just says that you participated in something and um, that would be a way to sort of quantify our professional development process so if we know say that we have to have three pedagogical badges and two you know collegiality badges I don't know I'm just making this up but you know quantify what it takes to get promoted from instructor to assistant professor and like that uh, I think that would be a really helpful thing and um, in the same vein we want to look at the instructor portion of our um, professional development process with a little bit more specificity so right now the description um, you know, on our annual reviews um, packet that we get from HR is, is a little bit difficult to understand what exactly we're supposed to be proving. But if we have uh, more specific competencies that are important, then you would know, oh, I need to do some professional work on this area. Um, and so we have in our full document, we have listed some suggested competencies from some of the resources that we found. And so, you know, but it's things like, um, engaging students and, and the things that we all know make an instructor very good and so that's I think it should be outlined more specifically um, we should emphasize things like universal design so everybody has access to all of our materials that we're producing um, emphasize equity and diversity because those are the things that that will help our community develop and keep our students on track 
Um, the next bullet is about supplemental instruction. So we have a very nice summary of a lot of research uh, done by Bree from the Learning Commons. And um, essentially, there are a lot of different models for supplemental instruction, but the idea is that you've embedded some help in, the, in your own course in whatever form the instructor thinks is helpful to the students. And um, the key though is that the tutors and the instructors need to be trained together for it to work really well. Um, so we think that the TLC could have a role in that part of training them, training us. And um, another thing that we had feedback on even before this situation with the remote learning happened was that it would be nice to have more access for online tutoring for students. Uh, our returning adult students really need that because they have jobs and children and all sorts of stuff like that, but a variety of our students would benefit from a more flexible um, availability of, of supplemental instruction. We already have the tools to do that. The Learning, learning Center is doing a great job of handling all of our tutoring online at this time, so that shouldn't be too big of a change. It's just more a matter of making sure students know that it's available. Um, we have a lot of suggestions for essentially how to diversify our hiring pools. Um, so one thing would be to evaluate the equal opportunity statement that we have. It's very short and the ones from other universities that we thought were um, following best practices are much more comprehensive. So I think looking at that would be good. Um, we would like to go back to having larger screening committees because that allows for a bigger group of uh, people to be involved in hiring. And the reason that that's important is because uh, we want to, uh, when we say diverse here, we're talking about diverse experience, diverse socioeconomic and racial and all of that. We want all of it to be included, different roles at the college to be included. Um, with a smaller hiring committee, it's pretty difficult to get a really diverse group of people um, to be looking at these resumes. We also want to extend the core workshop that we sort of all went through this, this semester um, so that anybody ser serving on the screening committee is aware of their biases and gets a little bit of training on how to handle it and be in front of that instead of, um, uh, instead of not knowing what to do. So the test that we talked about at the I forget the name of it, maybe someone else remembers, but we all, there's a bias test that you can use as sort of a baseline and, and, and grow from there before you are responsible as a screening committee member. Amanda, it's implicit bias test, IAT. Thank you. Yeah, that one. Um, so we also wanna remove as much identifying information as possible from, um, from what the the screening committee members see. So in other words, names, addresses, um, that kind of information creates an implicit bias that we could avoid uh, just by not having it on the materials that the members see. We also talked a great deal about the way that different uh, centers onboard. And so um, what I mean by that is that once you have hired somebody, every hiring manager uh, on our campus has a different way of bringing them onto, into our culture. And one of the ideas that we really liked is being done by some student affairs, par some parts of student affairs. They call it a cultural orientation. And the idea of this is basically that you get to meet a diverse group of people uh, one at a time. Uh, across the campus and that sort of helps to to orient people to to how we run our campus and how how we approach being student-centered and I think that would be a useful thing for everybody to experience. Um, it also can help foster uh, mentorships among like new faculty and things like that from when they're first beginning their their journey here. We also want to look at what instructional technology works best for keeping students on track. Um, one thing that was resoundingly true for most of us is um, that if you have a more consistent experience in your learning management system, students do better. I've experienced this when I've taken graduate classes online. Um, I don't go back to campuses where it's hard to figure out where to submit my assignments, you know. 
I stick with the ones where it's consistent from one class to the next. Um, and I think we could learn from that process. Uh, so things like having um, a syllabus button that's in the same place for every class, having, um, you know, I forget exactly what our outline said, but uh, having everything kind of consistent across the board. And that doesn't mean that you have to do the same type of assignments and it doesn't mean you have to do the same type of um, instruction. It just means that the, the materials are located in a reliable place so that students don't have to spend such a huge amount of their cognitive load just figuring out how to navigate your website. We also want to look at using a different LMS. Some LMSs are already more consistent. So one that came up quite a bit is like Canvas is set up to be more consistent between classes. Um, there's others, D2L, things like that. And it might be that they might actually save us some money. So um, just kind of uh, some work group looking at the options would be a good idea at this point. We also learned that um, if you provide withdrawal alerts to instructors and sometimes even a delay in the ability to withdraw, it reduces, uh, it, it reduces the withdrawal weight. So in other words, I've had students withdraw from a class because they thought they weren't doing well and then it turns out they were getting a C or a B and when you talk to them, they can change their mind. But often we as instructors don't even know they have withdrawal until you hit the midterm grade point or something like that. Um, we also suggest revising the existing uh, end of semester survey to be a little more teaching centered, uh, having some information about what we can do better as instructors would be helpful. Um, and the last suggestion was uh, to think about whether it makes sense for us to do a registration hold in order to encourage people to finish their end of term surveys. This, is, this may be important because if we do move to an online survey system going forward, the return rates on online surveys are really, really low. And so that doesn't help us to improve teaching if we don't get enough feedback. And so some schools do put holds on things in order to try and encourage response rate. So the TLC center would, uh, well, that's redundant. So TLC staff would uh, maintain records of what we need to be putting in our syllabus. And so we have already a website where this is being done and it includes all of the guidelines from middle states, SUNY, and then our local requirements like our DGB statement and things like that. Um, it would be nice if all of these things were in one location so that each semester you just go there and download the information that you need or link to it. And um, we also wanna require universal design rather than suggest it. And it should be integral to everything we produce on this campus in terms of academic information. Um, it's okay if you have a second version of your syllabus. So like my syllabus has a lot of pictures and, <clears throat> excuse me, and all kinds of stuff on it. And I know that that's not very accessible. So I made a second version that's just a text document. And that's fine. As long as the information is the same, we're fine with that. But it should be um, universal design integrated everywhere in our campus. Um, in order to ensure people are following along with what the, the syllabi need to be, um, we need to start actually looking at them, not just collecting them in a pile. I think it's pretty important that <clears throat> people are up to date. Sorry about that. Um, people are up to date in what um, needs to be included in each syllabus. Uh, some of the stuff like that our tutors have seen is, is really out of date or just doesn't have all the information it should in it. And so that's that's hard for students because that makes that's your sort of roadmap for how the course is going to go and they need that. Um, we want to look at the, the statements we put on our syllabi right now and make sure that they're still relevant and that they still should be on the syllabus, um, that they don't need to be reworded or, or changed up a little bit in light of the, the new student centered approach we have. Um, we'd also like all of our syllabi statement to be available on a tab in Blackboard. Um, kind of like we created um, resources for students uh, when we switched to remote learning right in Blackboard. They don't even have to really log in. You can just kind of click on it. Um, 
That way you know for sure that the most up-to-date policies are accessible to everybody at, at all times. And finally, this is, this is my favorite one. Uh, we need to have a deadline for changes to the syllabus policies because there's been semesters when I've drafted my syllabi, sent them out to the print shop, and then we get an email saying, oh, wait, 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 this needs to be changed. Um, and then I have to print an addendum and it's just uh, a bit of a headache. So a little bit more formality there would be helpful for instructors. Um, so classroom spaces are a problem. I do a lot of group work, uh, a lot of um, think pair share type strategies, but I'm always in a room that doesn't have any space to walk around or move desks in because my classes are 40 people and, and the rooms are just not accommodating that for that sort of teaching. So we talked uh, pretty extensively about the research on different spaces that you might use to teach in different ways, but um, like having more whiteboards around so students can work out problems and um, having, having desks that can be moved around. And some of our classrooms already have some flexibility, but it would be very helpful to evaluate what we can do um, to make the rooms a little bit more accommodating. Also, it was brought up that some classrooms have blackboards, um, like, well, whiteboards usually, but uh, they have the, the front of the rooms are facing each other and some teachers are able to project more than others. And so some soundproofing behind the blackboards, um, the whiteboards, could help alleviate some strain for, for some people when people are teaching adjacent to each other. Um, and then finally, just maintaining the technology and the spaces, um, it needs to be an important focus. If we're gonna invest in, in good spaces, we need to make sure that they stay viable in the future. And also that it's clear who you contact when, when this thing breaks or that thing breaks. Um, the last suggestion we have, the last recommendation we have is that the campus should develop a teaching wide, um, meaning everybody's involved, a teaching principle. And there are some really great examples in our recommendations um, that are just a one sheet kind of summary of what we believe. Um, and I think that's a great idea. It's kind of like a compact vision board, if you will, but um, we want to make sure it's student focused and inclusive and that it, it is clear that we know that teaching is a dynamic process and that it will sort of change over time, but we always remain student focused. Um, and then this is a good chance to also integrate our understanding that, that assessment is an ongoing process and that that culture is integral to how we teach. Okay, so now we can open up the floor for questions. You can unmute yourselves if you want to speak, that's fine. Hey, Amanda, it's Robert Hike. Hey, Robert, how are you doing? Good. Years ago, I tried to get chalkboards you're talking blackboards, chalkboards out of the rooms because mm -hmm. first of all, they're desk to any computer. Yep. And ultimately it was uh, held up because there were a lot of older faculty that really liked chalkboards still. Um, and I work in a couple classrooms that are filthy because of the chalkboards. Yeah. Uh, any ideas about that? I agree with you on both the computer front and my breathing. <laughs> um, I think, to my knowledge, most of the faculty I know of that did love the chalkboards have retired. So it may be a good chance to do that as part of the classroom improvements. Um, so we'll note that one down and we could put that in there explicitly. I think that's probably not a bad idea. Another thought is, is the classrooms are not really, and you were talking about setting it up to engage with the students easier. Um, AB is a really uh, hodgepodge of different squares and rectangles and yep. God knows what other uh, types of shapes. Um, any thoughts about how those rooms are gonna be taken care of in your discussions? 
I don't know what the solutions are. So our recommendations aren't that specific. We're kind of looking to start that conversation. Uh, but I agree. I, some of those rooms are too narrow. Some of them maybe should be oriented a different way than they are um, or have fewer students in it. I don't know what the answers are, but I agree that it's a problem. Amanda, I take it that uh, some of this is not taking into account the potential for social distancing that may go on uh, for a number of months, if not a year. Yeah, well, so um, I've been thinking a lot about that personally, because I usually get put in some classrooms right across the hall from my office in AB and they're they're really really narrow and there is absolutely no way to fit 40 people in there six feet apart even 20 I think would be a difficult thing to do and then you got the hallways so that's a whole other ball of wax I think that the facilities people really are I think struggling with in terms of how do we even um, manage traffic and how do we fit people in classrooms and I think that the administrators are working on that too but um, it isn't included in this because our recommendations were actually drafted mm, mostly before January. And so we're just revising at this point, but um, I'm not sure if we should address social distancing in these recommendations because they are kind of, I think that might be an administrative task, but we could if people think that that's an important thing to add. What do you think? Should we include it? I don't know. To some extent, I think the governor and, and their office is gonna tell us what we have to do on that front really, but I might be wrong about that. Dayton pointed out that in AB, it's hard to get some of the rooms heated. I absolutely agree. It's also hard to get some of them not heated. The, the radiators are a little uneven. No, I'm not a retired faculty, but I actually abs not absolutely hate the chalkboards because some of our physics demo kits, they don't stick to the whiteboards. They stick better to chalkboards. So I think Tracy is mentioning that we could buy chalkboard markers instead of using you know, actual chalk in those classrooms. Um, also, another thing I, have, I kind of see a problem is that writing spaces are only limited to the front of the classroom and not the sides. And that might be the spaces are too small. Yeah, I, yeah, that's what I was alluding to when I said putting whiteboards. So like there's one classroom with chalkboards all, almost all the way around and I really like teaching in that room because you can separate students into different groups, but I don't like the chalkboard. <laughs> yeah, I think it'd be nice to have that more more rooms. Okay, so for our team monitoring the chat, is there anything that you think we should address verbally? I think we have answered a few questions. Okay. Um, Amanda, I just have one recommendation. Sure. Uh, I think it's important um, to get other faculty and stuff uh, to buy in and to participate in this yeah. because I think there are several of you that were on this group that put forth the recommendations that have degrees in curriculum learning and design I think Jocelyn does and I'm sure there's probably others of you that have that expertise that whenever you can share that with the other faculty and let them know that just because we're saying this is best practices it's not just a catch term that you're throwing around that you actually have the expertise and the training and 
to make these recommendations. I think that goes a long way to bring people along who might otherwise be like, eh, well, you know, just because I think that that's helpful. Um, I know that for me, I always like to know when people are giving me information and they say, well, we did this research, we've done this and that. It's just, I don't know if there's some place where you can share that information, but I think that's useful for other people to convince them to come along that Rogers learning curve, that it'll bring them along to adopt these things more quickly. But it's just a recommendation. Actually in the document, explaining something about ourselves is kind of what you're suggesting yeah just, just so we can see because there's so many people on talent who have or there's so many people on campus who participate in these groups who have the expertise the educational training beyond their discipline mm -hmm. to offer recommendations and sometimes i think it just kind of falls on deaf ears because you know faculty get busy doing their own thing in their own discipline so i think it's just another kind of hook a way to um, convince kind of the slow adopters to jump on the way again and to get this going faster. It's just, you know, another way. Okay. So. Okay. Thank you. I'm hoping too that the badging system and sort of outlining um, our annual review process a little bit more clearly would also help in the future, like not with just these recommendations, but to sort of shift our culture to, to a more um, incentivized process. Any other thoughts? We're wide open. Whatever you guys, you guys think would help to encourage our students to stay on track and succeed would be, as far as teaching goes, it would be included here. Minda? Uh, so this is Christine, um, tagging on to Stacy's comment, um, uh, two different thoughts. Yeah, I think um, what you just said, the badging system and using professional development could be a way to disseminate that information for faculty who maybe need more training in specific areas. Mm -hmm. But also um, for the enrichment team, um, we are looking at um, an overhaul to and changes to new faculty institute and certainly for faculty that are brand new to the college definitely we could use um, many of these recommendations as a, a way of leveraging um, you know use these recommendations in the the training that we offer to new faculty as they come into the college okay yeah, I guess I could envision a, a place where you don't have to spend so much time talking about Blackboard <laughs> at NFI and instead could could address more of a immediate, because then you can just refer people to a webinar that's already recorded and stuff like that. Yeah, sure. Oh, so in the chat, Gail has said that um, a return to work safety plan is in motion. I thought perhaps that's good to know. Um, social distancing will more than likely be included in the plan. Okay, so I don't think that we need to address that in our recommendations. It's not directly teaching related, um, although it will certainly impact how and where we teach, I think, but. Okay, a lot of positive feedback in the chat right now about um, the delayed withdrawal or the withdrawal alerts that we're suggesting, so that's good. <clears throat> okay, so if, if no one else has any other thoughts, I think, I think we can end here. You can always email me or you can, um, look at our Google document with our actual recommendations and make comments there. I'll be sending the slides and the recording and everything out on our workplace. Um, if you want to, to comment there, that's also fine with me. Okay, any last thoughts? All right, everybody, thanks for coming. We appreciate your feedback and uh, I, hope, I hope you get to come to some of the 
happy hours and relax a little bit. We're done. Yay. Hardest semester ever is over. <laughs> Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, yeah, Amanda, great job. Thank you for um, presenting. And thank you to the whole team, you guys. We did a lot of really good work this last year. Thank so. Thank you, Amanda. Amanda, I saved the chat, or do you want to save it? Make, just in case. If you saved it, that would be great. I'm not actually. All right, I'll send it to you. Thank you. I, I, I copied and pasted some comments too in my notes as well. Oh, good. Okay, perfect. It's funny watching people's faces scroll by as other people leave. <laughs> this is the most people I've seen in the last two months. <laughs> that was a, it was a good turnout. Yeah. 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 Hey, you guys, really thanks, for, thanks for all your hard work and uh, have a good summer. Stay healthy. Get some sunshine. Take care. Too. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. So I put my notes at the bottom of the UTL recommendations narrative uh, okay. Google Doc. Oh, okay. So after references, it says feedback from Summer Institute, and I put the date and any feedback people gave. 